Good evening, everyone. Uh, very happy to see the full house uh, tonight. We were waiting all day for this event. And I also wanted to say uh, good afternoon to our online audience and our audience in, in Prague. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our post-election uh, webinar. Uh, today we will be talking about the impact of uh, the 2024 Taiwan elections on uh, Taiwan-EU relations and Taiwan international space. So this event is uh, organized by the European Value Center for Security Policy. We are the first uh, European think tank to have established uh, its permanent uh, representative office here in Taiwan. And today we are also joined by uh, our uh, colleagues at the headquarters in Prague. Hello. <laughs> Yes, and uh, the place we are at right now is the Czech Hub, which is the joint venture between uh, the EBC and uh, Czech uh, Taiwanese uh, Business Chamber. And uh, it was officially uh, inaugurated last year in March of 2023 by the Honorable Marketa uh, Pekarova Adamova. Okay, so uh, today we have uh, three distinguished uh, speakers. Um, so the first one uh, here, uh, the closest to me, is Dr. Qing Xin You, uh, Marcin Jerzewski, and uh, Hang Yin Jen. Um, I would like to, before we start, I would like to uh, briefly introduce uh, our distinguished guests. Uh, Dr. You serves as director and distinguished uh, research fellow uh, of the Election Studies Center at the National Gentry University. Taiwan's leading institution dedicated to studying election systems and political behavior. His research expertise involves um, comparative politics, political institutions, uh, parties and elections, voting behavior, democratization theory, and research design and methodology. Uh, Dr. Yo earned his PhD from the Department of Political Science at the University of Pennsylvania. Mr. Martin Jerzewski uh, is a political scientist and sinologist and also the head of Taiwan office of the European Value Center for Security Policy. He is also a research fellow at Taiwan Next Gen Foundation and uh, a contributor to the China Observers in Central Eastern Europe, a platform of the Association for International Affairs. And his research interests include Taiwan-EU relations, comparative politics, and international political economy. And Mr. Uh, Heng Yu-Jian uh, is the deputy foreign editor of Storm Media, covering global and foreign affairs. Recently, he composed a series of articles about Taiwan's diplomatic situation from the perspective of, of young diplomats, retired ambassadors, and scholars. And our today's event uh, is divided into several parts. Um, during the first part, each of our distinguished speakers will have uh, about 15 minutes to share uh, their remarks. Uh, then uh, we will have a tea break, and then um, around 8 uh, to 8.30, we will start our discussion and uh, Q&A. And I just wanted to mention here to our uh, audience online uh, that if you have any questions, please write them in the chat box, and we will, uh, we will uh, read them later. And uh, later on, uh, around 8.30, uh, we will have our networking to around 9 o'clock. So, if we could start, please, Dr. Yo. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, um, my name is Ching Xin Yu from Tsinghua University. It's my pleasure to be here. And also, uh, I would like to appreciate the invitation of the hub and also the, the uh, uh, EVC. Uh, actually, it's a, it, it, as far as I know, it's a good institution in, in Prague. And, uh, very, very much strong uh, democracy advocate in, in the area. So um, I, I'm happy to be here to show you some idea about this uh, election just finished last week. Um, it is a presidential election that's for sure nationalized. And uh, I would say in my presentation, just uh, follow some sections. One or four, well, the first one should be some, tell you some structural factors in Taiwan, political factors or political structures in Taiwan that constrain 
those behavior of politicians and, part and part political parties. And then try to ex tell you about some, well, uh, personal insights about this election and what are most important or what the impact will continue to uh, uh, in the next four years and also some challenge of this new government. Then try to uh, bring you to some idea about China because when you're talking about the external factors, um, it's China, always China and Taiwan. So um, also then uh, connect to China to the uh, European countries and then concluding as the, uh, the uh, democracy prospect in Taiwan. So that's the whole structure. So I believe you have, believe, I believe you have with some of the materials. I'm not going to lecture you one by one, so that uh, I hate to do that because I've done this for past 30 years already. So just, just talk, okay? Uh, the, the first one about the uh, structural issues in Taiwan, I would say that, well, Taiwan is a very unique country. Uh, we are divided in terms of identity and we are debated in terms of preference for independence. And right now, uh, we have uh, more than 60% of people in Taiwan say, I'm Taiwanese. But actually, as a nigga speaking, we are Chinese. My fathers, my grandfathers, my ancestors came from mainland China. So it should be something different from ethnic issues. So it's political identity issues, more importantly. So people identify themselves Taiwanese. And the DPP, the right now incumbent party, he has, is a party advocate or embrace the idea of Chinese identity. So that will explain why TPP is so popular in Taiwan in these elections recently. And the other issue, which I say is also structured about the preference of independence. Because in Taiwan, we are not allowed to uh, independent because of Beijing government. But uh, as a democratic country, we uh, have a freedom to choose our future, right? So it's quite, Interesting in Taiwan, say, if you identify yourself Taiwanese, then you pursue a Taiwanese nation, right? Um, but in reality, people in Taiwan are more cautious or to some degree more rational to say that, well, we actually, we prefer independence, but we don't speak out. We say we are going to preserve, independ uh, preserve the status quo. So maintaining the status quo right now, that would be current situation right now. That means... Well, Taiwan and China, two sides, two governments, one authoritarian, the other democratic one. So that would say that in Taiwan, that would be the status quo. That we are going to, we are not going to change the status quo. So if you ask people, they, do you prefer independence or unification, they would say status quo. But if you go deeper, actually those, pro, those people who prefer status quo are more close to in, prefer independence. But if we ask directly to these people, say that, well, status quo. So uh, it is right to say that, well, some people say in Taiwan, status quo equals to independence. Just we don't do any de jure declaration of independence, but we are de facto independence. So that's the situation so far. So these two structures well, will become, continue to be the uh, new government's policy, say that, well, we pursue an independent or autonomous policy internationally, but we would not pursue the dual independence. So you can see that the other line, the DPP candidate during the campaign period, even though he is a practical uh, worker for power independence, that's for him to classify himself. Uh, he's a, to, to some degree, he's a diehard pro-independence. But during campaign, he didn't mention about his attributes about himself. He just says, I'm going to preserve the current status. So for some DBB people, they would say that, well, the, 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 the term status quo equals who independence. But on the other hand, there are some people in Taiwan say that, well, status quo does not mean independence. We are continue to preserve the possibility say that, well, sometimes we have uh, the Republic of China continue on this island. Even though there's a people from China in Taiwan, a man in China, but still on this island, we are ROC here. And this ROC should be different from PRC, that's one thing. And also some people say that, well, it's not bad to unify in the future if China changed dramatically, I mean, politically, economic, socially. That means the similar situation like Taiwan. So that's another possibility for invocation. So preference for independence or invocation is an open issue in Taiwan. 
So even though you can track, say that, well, since we do see an increase of Taiwanese identity, that should create a more increase of Taiwan independence. But that does not happen so far. Okay? But it's rational to expect that kind of future. And the third structural factor for, for Wei Lai is the, well, the legacies of the Thai administration. I mean, President Thai, she has been here for, she has been in office for eight years. The past eight years, actually, we follow his, we have follow her approval rating. We found that, well, she done a pretty good job. And even to the second term of her presidency, he continue, she continued to receive about more than 45% of approval rating, which is good if you compare to other democratic countries. Or well, the president with second terms is a good one. Also, that explains a little bit about why the DPP continue to empower this, this election. So these are the three structural factors, I would like to say, before the election on this one. And then come to the winner and losers. Actually, uh, I would say, even though DPP win the presidency, but uh, the DPP didn't perform as well as they did four years ago. And it was a sharp drop of performance in terms of lies, within lies, uh, popular vote. So that was a strong decline for the DPP too. Even though the DPP wins the election, the reason why DPP wins just because the opponents or the competitors are weak, to some degree. Um, because before the election, that we found that around 80, around 60 percent of population say we want to change the government, but people also find difficulties to find a good alternative to replace the DPP. Why have to replace? Because of economic issues, and why they fail to replace them? Because they don't have good candidates. The KMT and the, the KMT candidate uh, Hoi Yi and also the uh, TPP's candidate Kwanza, they try to cooperate but they fail to do that. If they're succe successful in the cooperation, then that could be a replacement for the government right now, but they fail to do that, okay? So that's the reason uh, to account for the, uh, the, the, the success of the DPP, but it's now truly a real uh, uh, victory in the election on this one. So that, that's the winner and losers. And also, one winner should be the DPP. That means this minor party become significant. Uh, not, much, not many people expect the TPP will survive in this election, but they did, and they continue to perform quite well. So perhaps uh, accounts, it is a count to those younger cohort who support this new party. But also, the, this new party is, is new. So sometimes we are not able to, to expect too much about this new party because in Taiwan's political structure, the whole constitutional design and the institution they are very hostile to new parties. Okay, so uh, we have to see about this new party, how they survive in this one. So that's the new, uh, the winner and, and loser this one. And challenging remains. Even though we and I continue to the uh, DPP's government in Taiwan, but still we do see that, well, the internal issues, particularly from the economic side, from the social oil issues, economic development, and law theory issues, these are critical issues discussed in election. And this could be some negative legacy from the Thai government. So that would be the challenge for the Western Nai. And externally, again, China. China has defined Western Nai as a people, uh, as a president pro-independence, for sure. So we don't see any good signs in the, this coming months or until, the, uh, until the May for the inauguration of the new president. So that would be the critical period in this time. So we will see that, well, maybe the Asian government tried to do something to uh, embarrass in Taiwan's uh, political situation so far. Okay. And then come to the China factor. Um, when I just mentioned about people in Taiwan do have a very different attitude toward men in China in terms of identity, in terms of preference for education. And another one is that people in Taiwan also divided of their attitude on the economic election with men in China. People say that, well, we should continue to have economic interaction with mainland China. But on the other hand, people are concerned about the uh, security uh, issues, uh, or the, the so-called military threat uh, from the Beijing government. So people are divided, divided in this. And people try to say that, well, uh, China is a, not a good neighbor. That's for sure. 
the only way we conduct, we conduct our engagement with mainland China could be some economic issues, some cultural issues, but not political. So you can see a uh, very interesting flag, uh, slide in my, in my, in my uh, materials as well. People, they try to ask the government to go faster under the DPP government. I mean, to go faster interaction with mainland China under the DPP government and go slower under the KMT government. Well, it seems a crazy one, right? You choose the DPP government, the government, the, the political party, advocates a pro-independence, advocates an anti-China stance. But you choose this government and ask the government to engagement faster with mainland China. And you choose the KMT government, you say, go slower. This is the puzzle issues in Taiwan. And uh, we try to figure out what happened. Uh, a beautiful explanation would be that, well, people are rational enough. They understand the government, DPP, is anti-China. So, but we should not keep China too far away. So try to push the government a little bit closer. And for the DPP to cross to China, we are afraid to do that. So try it back a little bit. That is rational uh, explanation, but we don't have evidence so far. Okay, it's open to the floor to discuss this one. And also, people in Taiwan, uh, if you try to trace back about the attitude towards China, are they very diehard hawkish or dovish? I would say dovish. That means people will not seek military uh, confrontation directly to a mainland China. They would have to use some political or diplomatic issue, uh, measures to negotiate with mainland China to, well, to, to cool down those uh, military tension on this one. So, that's the general public attitude in Taiwan to what mainland China in terms of economy and security. And for summary issues, that's for sure. People understand that China tried to use political uh, benefit to Taiwan to gain some political concession internationally. That's for sure. Yeah. So people in Taiwan are not that comfortable, even though we enjoy democracy for quite a long time, but not comfortable with the cost relations. Okay. Then I'll come to the... Uh, uh, another external issue about uh, external relations with European countries. Uh, I, I would say that um, European country is not that significant as, okay, I will say EU-Taiwan relations is not that popular as US-Taiwan relations. Not only the government, but also for people. The government has too much, has, has put too much effort on U.S. Taiwan relations, that's for sure, because of the security issues. And people are also learned and educated. Actually, I would say that most of the professors in the university were educated from many in the United States. That brings quite a lot of U.S. influence in Taiwan, that's for sure. Much less to the uh, people uh, to learn in Europe and return to Taiwan. That, that's another story. Okay, I, I would say that uh, the, the past situation so far is that we have too much emphasis on U.S. Taiwan relations, not EU Taiwan relations. But recently, we do find particular after the COVID, during COVID period, that uh, when China become a quite a, well, globally, globally resented object, to, to say this way. And then we found that we have some friends in Europe. And Europe tried to do, well, tried to find, well, Taiwan is an important, uh, well, in terms of economy, in terms of security issues. So we do find that we have a graduate contact with the uh, uh, members, EU members uh, in recent years, particularly for the, some individual EU members on this one. So I would say that uh, we do see an expanding relation between EU and Taiwan. And I, I would say that Taiwan has tried to develop its own EU policy, including some economic one and some security one. Security is a little bit remote, but economy is much more likely to achieve this one. For example, in, in 2022, I put this here, uh, Taiwan tried to create the uh, EU-Taiwan bilateral uh, agreement, this one, BIA, but uh, unfortunately it was denied by EU uh, parliament. Uh, but continue, this effort will be continued for the new government to do that. That means, economically speaking, Taiwan has to bridge some uh, EU uh, market or countries to have a develop its own economy, to globalize or to diversify its own economic issues because we have a too much economic dependence on China. So that would be good for Taiwan. And, and also we do see some, 
security issues. We do find that some EU uh, efforts, some resolutions or some uh, announcement by the e European Parliament to say to enhance the uh, EU co cooperation or interaction with Taiwan, including not only economy, but also some security issues or some disinformation or uh, uh, security issue on this one. So, so I would say that in recently, uh, we have a new pages between Taiwan and the EU relations, and particular for some EU countries. But still, we are a little bit worried about that. For example, why you uh, deny uh, Taiwan's request for the, uh, the uh, BIA issues on this one? Um, if we don't, not, we are not able to get some BIA issues with EU, and we should get some alternative one. That means try to facilitate Taiwan's economy with the EU area. That's what we try to do. And that will be another uh, tax for the new government. And also, we are a little bit worried about the new development. I mean, the post-COVID development. We do find that, well, the post-COVID development with this is that, well, the EU country tried to expand their internet, in the economic interaction with mainland China. Again, okay? And by, by doing all this expansion, that would sometimes put Taiwan as a secondary status on this one. That's, that's for sure. Uh, we do see some, uh, for example, the, the Germany and also France, and also some, uh, the leader of these, these two countries, they visit Taiwan, visit China, go off and try to do some economic interaction, this one. And they are much more uh, reluctant to say about Taiwan status on this one. Okay, so that's because the one China policy was implemented in EU. Um, for Taiwan, I, I will say that, well, uh, we don't, we don't interrupt the EU's policy of one China policy in uh, engaging with mainland China. But we we'll try to see that, well, there is one China and one Taiwan, that will be quite different. And Ch Taiwan has its own values, not only for democracy, but also for ec economic, economic achievement in this one. And also some, well, the so-called military uh, or geopolitical status in this area. So the value of Taiwan is there and it, depends on the, the thinking of the uh, EU leaders to say, well, it's time to rethink about, to, to re-measure the importance of Taiwan in terms of Taiwan-China relation, not just put Taiwan under the title of China. Okay, now that's what we try to say on this one. And uh, the last one, uh, uh, also the other one is that, well, Taiwan has continued to expand its EU relations for sure, because in recently, Taiwan government has tried to develop quite a lot of cooperation projects between uh, Taiwan and the EU or some EU individual countries uh, through the economic interactions, through the uh, uh, educational program ex exchange and also some uh, delegation uh, visit and this one. So that put EU as now remote area. So I, I would say that compared to previous decades, uh, EU relations with Taiwan is more closer than ever. And, but not closer enough for myself because right now we are still pretty much U.S. dominate in Taiwan area. So we try to get a more balanced East one. Okay, the last one I would say that, well, democracy issue in Taiwan. Okay, uh, we try to say we share some democratic values with European countries. And Taiwan is a very unique country, as you say that. People prefer democracy, people love democracy, but people are not satisfied with the government so far. So we have some, some kind of democracy deficit to some degree. That means we don't satisfy with the government. So between 2000 to 2024, well, this election is the first one that the incumbent party continue to empower. Before that, we just changed the new government, changed to the new government. So uh, we are not satisfied because we have some issues in, uh, to, to be solved. But actually, in terms of democracy value, people in Taiwan, they, we do really heartfully embrace democracy as the best in system for Taiwan. And I think this is quite unique for the, all these Chinese society and this one. And also for the prospect of democracy, I would say that, well, people are quite confident about Taiwan democracy. Uh, if you were in Taiwan in last week, uh, you can see the campaign, uh, it's a little bit chaotic, right? But you can even able to imagine, so chaotic issue, development uh, be, before election day, but one day after the election, it's so peaceful on this island. Everybody just go back to work, and we don't, 
we don't fight, we don't, we don't shut out anyone. So we have a practice a democracy, which is quite tiny this way. And we are able to select our, 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 our top leaders. And we are, select, we, are, we are happy to have some policy to be open debate. And we are able, able to criticize the government. So all these democratic programs, we are not, good, we are not satisfied with, with the leader. But we continue to embrace the value of democracy, and that could continue. We found this attitude for the past two decades already. So we are not worried to have some regression of the authoritarian retreat for Taiwan, but we do have some competence in Taiwan for the good prospect in Taiwan. Okay, I make it quick, and I should pass this time to Machine. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yu. Good evening, dear guests. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us on this discussion about the impact of the recent elections on Taiwan EU elections on this uh, very cold evening. Um, I, I would like to also make a personal note. It's very special uh, for me to see so many of you here because it's actually uh, my birthday today. <laughs> and. <laughs> And uh, thank you all so much for giving me a very indulgent gift, a gift of a captive audience. <laughs> so, uh, Taiwan-EU relations are uh, difficult, and uh, irrespective of the result of the elections, the uh, future of ties between Taiwan and Europe was never going to be uh, smooth sailing. And a part of uh, the reason for it is that uh, the European Union is very complicated. Um, it is a very unique uh, political entity that comprises of 27 member states with very different priorities. And while um, the project of uh, European integration is um, a really unique in human history endeavor uh, aimed at securing uh, peace after um, centuries of brutal wars in Europe, um, at the end of the day, it is still an entity comprised of uh, nation states that have uh, competing economic and, and political interests. So whenever we talk about Taiwan-Europe relations, it is important that uh, there is actually a two-track approach that uh, Taiwan needs to navigate. Uh, Taiwan needs to navigate the relationship with the European Union as a whole, with EU27, and then, where possible, with member states. Uh, currently in Taiwan, out of the 27 EU member states, 16 of them are represented in one way or another in the form of um, various representative offices. And um, actually, um, uh, Dr. Yo already mentioned that uh, particularly since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen uh, a window of opportunity for expansion of Taiwan-Europe ties. and. I believe especially uh, ties between Taiwan and Central Eastern Europe. And what I think is interesting to note and what is often uh, lost in, uh, the, uh, in the discussion about Taiwan-Europe ties is that for Central Eastern Europe this is actually a second uh, opening uh, towards Taiwan. So Central Eastern European countries uh, began their transition to democracy in the late 1980s and that's exactly when Taiwan um, started to uh, transition to democracy as well. So Central Eastern European countries in Taiwan are generally uh, known as, uh, par as uh, participants in the Huntingtonian third wave of uh, democratization. And because of that, because of this uh, similarity in the trajectory of their political development, it, there was this first opening in the 1990s. And, uh, I would say that uh, European countries that were um, exploring new ways to uh, expand their own international space were quite creative in uh, how they wanted to engage with Taiwan. So, um, for example, Poland uh, quite early on realized that even though state-to-state -state relations with Taipei uh, would be difficult to maintain, subnational diplomacy was a, a viable channel to deepen those ties. And, um, it was precisely the signing of the sister city agreement between our respective national capitals, Warsaw and Taipei, in 1995 that served as a justification for the opening of uh, the, what was then known as the Warsaw Trade Office, what is now known as the uh, Polish office in Taipei. Um, the Czech Republic uh, was also very friendly uh, towards Taiwan during early years of uh, its uh, democratization. And, a lot of it was driven by uh, Czechia's former president, Václav Havel, 
Um, very famously in 1995, he spoke in front of the uh, United Nations General Assembly, defying his own uh, foreign minister and advocated for uh, inclusion of Taiwan in the, in the works of the United Nations. Um, arguably, Latvia was the most daring one because in 1992, the Latvian parliament flirted with the idea of recognizing both the PRC and the ROC. That never came to fruition, but it laid the foundation for institutionalization of relations between um, Taipei and, and, and Riga. And the Taipei mission in Riga, uh, up until the opening of the infamous Taiwanese representative office in Vilnius, was managing relations between Taiwan and all the Baltic uh, three states. So, I think that understanding that it's the second wave of openness is important because it shows us that the Tsai administration uh, had uh, capital to build upon. It had lessons to um, draw from in uh, structuring its outreach to European countries. But uh, I can only echo another point uh, by um, Dr. Yo, and that is that we are close, but um, we are not uh, close enough. So. Today, I want to focus on uh, three specific areas and mechanisms of cooperation between Taiwan and Europe, which might be shaped by the outcome of the recent elections. And these three specifically include economic relations, both in terms of trade and investment. I will also uh, talk about uh, parliamentary diplomacy and how the uh, complex uh, makeup of the 11th legislative UN might affect uh, outreach to both the European Union and individual member states. And I will um, make, focus my uh, final point on uh, the role of human rights cooperation in Taiwan-Europe relations and uh, how the result of the elections might uh, affect the human uh, rights policy landscape in Taiwan. So, uh, of course, e economic relations are the cornerstone of exchanges between uh, the European Union and Taiwan. If we look at the European Union as a whole, so if we look at it as the EU27, the European Union is actually the largest uh, foreign investor in Taiwan. Uh, however, the total volume of Taiwanese investment stock in Europe remains uh, quite limited. So an important exercise for strengthening relations between Taiwan and Europe is to uh, present Europe as a viable investment destination for um, Taiwanese entrepreneurs. And there is some progress in this realm. So. Um, one of the biggest news in, in uh, Taiwan-Europe relations last year was the uh, announcement of a, a major uh, battery plant which will be opened by a Taiwanese investor in Dunkirk in uh, northern France. Uh, but there's, there's still space for improvement and I think that when it comes to um, economic relations, to some extent, um, the ball is in Taipei's court right now. Uh, on a, a personal level, and um, I would like to remind everyone that I work uh, for a think tank and not for EEAS, I think that um, the way the decision not to pursue a BIA with uh, Taiwan was uh, very poorly communicated. Uh, the message came out of the European External Action Service in March, and um, the then managing director for Asia Pacific at the EEAS considered, uh, uh, said openly that a BIA was not necessary because it was primarily political rather than economic since there was already a flow of investment uh, between both sides. The reason why I'm allowing myself to be so critical about it is that the European Commission did not pursue a formal impact assessment of that document, so there was definitely more uh, that the EU could have done, but at the same time, uh, Taipei needs to show Europe that it is a mature partner willing to listen to EU's concerns and, and, and ready to address them. And we actually uh, know what the desired roadmap in Brussels is because in mid-December last year, um, the European Parliament uh, accepted a resolution that calls on uh, increasing cooperation between EU and Taiwan on, uh, between EU and Taiwan on uh, supply chain resilience and also uh, reforms of the World Trade Organization. And um, Valdis Dombrovskis, uh, executive vice president of the European Commission, gave uh, a, a speech at the European Parliament before the, Euro uh, before the resolution was adopted and he said that um, even though there are little to no barriers to trade between Taiwan and Europe, um, there are still these issues of concern. And um, two specific concerns that we can zoom in on 
include very stringent uh, local content requirements uh, presented for offshore wind, uh, wind farms investments. Uh, I think that opening up um, uh, market access to European companies that have really deep know-how on offshore wind it would be very beneficial for Taiwan as well. Uh, Taiwan became one of the um, earliest uh, adopters of legal provisions um, for net zero in its uh, domestic legislation. Um, at the same time, uh, the, the issue with, with local content requirement uh, remains a big problem and it is uh, regularly raised uh, to the Tsai administration at the, at the highest level to uh, president herself and European diplomats are not the only ones who are doing that. This is a huge issue for um, Canada uh, and Australia, for instance. So. Um, definitely a lot of space for, um, for Taiwan to act in this realm. Additionally, uh, border quarantine regulations make it difficult to export uh, produced goods to Taiwan and um, some of the uh, processed goods that are affected by border quarantine include uh, meat products. And, um, you know, when we, when we look at the uh, headlines about Taiwan in major uh, global news outlets, uh, the focus is on the Silicon Shield, the focus is on TSMC, the focus is on uh, cutting edge high tech, so who cares about meat exports? And I think that this is a very valid question that we should be asking ourselves, but not only in Taiwan, but also in European countries, agriculture, uh, the agricultural sector is extremely politically influential. Um, let's take a look at Lithuania, uh, for example. One of the reasons why uh, the relations between Taiwan and Europe might be affected by the outcome of the upcoming elections, uh, parliamentary elections in Lithuania, is that uh, Lithuanian Farmers and Greens uh, Party is uh, regaining its strength. And one of their biggest achievements under the previous government was the opening of the Chinese market for Lithuanian food and agricultural producers. So if we look at trade data from 2020, one fifth of all uh, exports from Lithuania to China were cereal. And then when China uh, started to exercise economic coercion in uh, retaliation for opening of the Taiwanese trade office, uh, the representative office in Vilnius, it was farmers who were uh, disproportionately affected. So agriculture might not make up a huge chunk of uh, GDP either in Europe or in Taiwan, but uh, farmers are very powerful lobbyists. So. Uh, this is where um, we can make a connection to the outcome of uh, these elections. It is the Lai administration that will inherit uh, these problems in economic dealings between Taiwan and uh, the European Union. And I think that it is very fair to say that Taiwanese people did in fact vote for continuity when they casted their votes for uh, Lai. And um, putting Bi Kim Xiao in the position of the vice president is also a strong sign that the new administration is likely to continue the foreign policy trajectory defined by the Tsai administration. However, um, it remains to be seen whether Lai and Xiao will be capable of um, dealing with uh, this economic hot potato that they are inheriting from, um, from Tsai. So uh, there is definitely space for a pragmatic economic engagement and um, it, while a BIA might not happen because it, it was killed um, by the commission, I think that there is a lot of potential for um, uh, uh, sectoral agreements between uh, Taiwan and the European Union and um, definitely it, it is a task for Taipei to, to um, show goodwill towards the European Union and show its readiness to, to pursue those, those uh, agreements by addressing the issue that I just described. So um, let's move to parliamentary diplomacy. Given Taiwan's um, bizarre international status, contacts between the Taiwanese executive branch and uh, executive branch of um, its partner countries are often difficult. But it's parliamentarians, the elected officials, the voice of the people who often have much more flexibility in engaging with Taiwan and uh, whether in individual member states or in Brussels, it's usually the legislatures which are uh, more forthcoming when it comes to uh, engagements uh, with Taiwan. I mean, uh, we are at the Czech Hub in Taiwan right now, uh, a joint venture initiative between EVC and the Czech Taiwanese Business Chamber, which was inaugurated by Marketa Pekarova Adamova, the Speaker of the uh, Chamber of um, Deputies, the lower chamber of the uh, Czech Parliament, uh, when she came here last year with her historic 150 strong delegation. 
But then um, we have the question of who's going to be uh, the next speaker of the Legislative UN. And I think it's still fair to say that it's an open question. Uh, of course, you might have seen news that came out earlier today indicating that the Taiwan People's Party with their eight uh, elected members are likely to back um, the, the candidates put forward by uh, the Guomindang. Uh, so Guomindang uh, suggested that Han Guoyu, uh, the uh, first uh, ever mayor to be recalled in an election, um, and, and unequivocally a firebrand uh, would be um, the Speaker of the Legislative UN. We knew that that was going to be KMT's proposal quite early on since he was the number one on the party list. Uh, but then Johnny Jiang would be uh, his um, deputy. And I had some uh, conversations with uh, colleagues from the Guomindang um, about uh, how they envision the future of parliamentary diplomacy um, under the Han uh, Jiang leadership. And they said that they realized that Han Guoyu doesn't have an international profile. Uh, however, Johnny Jiang does, so they thought that uh, parliamentary diplomacy would be then relegated to, uh, to Jiang. Uh, I think that this is uh, a yellow flag because uh, Speaker Yo, uh, the current Speaker um, of uh, the Legislative UN, has um, really um, made a lot of improvements to institutionalizing um, the role of the Legislative UN as a body responsible for Taiwan's uh, international outreach. So very early after he was made the Speaker of the, of the Legislative UN, he established an international public opinion um, working group, which was then upgraded to international relations working group. And then um, ultimately uh, later this year, it was uh, officially announced that it was going to be upgraded to a, a full department of international affairs in charge of um, coordinating, uh, coordinating public uh, parliamentary diplomacy efforts. Um, Yo himself has also been quite active in uh, welcoming delegations uh, to Taiwan. So he met with his uh, counterparts, uh, famously uh, Milos Vistchil from the Czech Republic, who came here with a 90-strong delegation in 2020. Um, then uh, Marketa Pekarova Adamova, who was here last year. Also Viktoria Milite Nielsen, the speaker of the Lithuanian Seimas, um, who was here in 2013. And Yo himself also traveled extensively uh, reciprocating um, those visits. He visited uh, Czechia, Poland, and, uh, and Lithuania. So it remains to be seen. Uh, to what extent parliamentary diplomacy will be a priority um, for uh, a potential uh, Guomindang speaker and how effectively uh, Guomindang will uh, maintain or even expand the international posture uh, of the legislature. And um, then uh, just very briefly on uh, the topic of human rights. Uh, Europe, the European Union is often described as a, a normative power in academic literature. And um, we don't have to go into uh, the, the very academic details and how it's ingrained in constructivist literature, but basically what it means is that Europe seeks to um, strengthen its uh, international position through normative appeals. So uh, Europe is portraying itself as a good guy that not only follows the rules, but also enforces them in its international dealings. And that's why um, European Union's efforts uh, to strengthen democracy and human rights globally are very important in this outreach. And um, human rights consultations are one of the important mechanisms of high-level exchange between um, Taiwan and the European Union in compliance with the European Union's One China policy. Um, last year, the six uh, human rights consultations were held in Brussels. Um, on the Taiwanese side, the uh, representative in those consultations is uh, Minister without portfolio, uh, Luo Pingcheng. Uh, so that, that's what I mean when I refer to it as a, as a high um, level exchange. And the European Union has uh, put in place a lot of tools to strengthen its cooperation uh, in the realm of human rights with Taiwanese stakeholders. One example is the um, EU Taiwan Engagement Support Facility uh, that EBC is engaged in. So it is a project that focuses on cooperation on five uh, thematic issues, which are uh, important areas of concern for the European Union. It includes uh, working for abol towards abolition of the death penalty, strengthening uh, rights of uh, migrant workers, strengthening Taiwanese human rights institutions, 
and so on. One of the big issues is uh, the abolition of uh, the death penalty. Taiwan's status as a retentionist country is a, a major concern uh, for the European Union. And um, here as an anecdote, I can, I can share with you that um, Tsai Ing-wen, which uh, did not maintain a de facto moratorium on the death penalty, um, basically killed her administration's own public diplomacy efforts in 2020. Um, you may remember that shortly after the COVID-19 pandemic started to uh, rage uh, across Europe, Taiwan, uh, under its hashtag Taiwan Can Help, sent a lot of sorely needed uh, personal protective equipment items to Europe, including face masks. And uh, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen then thanked Taiwan by mentioning it by name. It was a very explicit statement on her Twitter. And uh, the following day, uh, the second execution under Tsai Ing-wen administration took place, uh, which of course resulted in a statement from the spokesperson of the European External Action Service and very much undermined uh, Taiwan's uh, potential role as a normative power and like-minded partner of the European Union. So the death penalty is a big deal, and how does it relate to the elections? Well. Something that we have seen in, in those recent elections is that a lot of younger politicians who entered electoral politics on the wave of the Sunflower Movement um, were not really uh, electorally successful. So, for example, um, in one of the constituencies in New Taipei City, uh, Lai Ping Yu from the Democratic Progressive Party, who was the youngest legislator in the 10th uh, current legislative union, did not uh, gain re-election. Um, she was a very outspoken um, advocate for migrant rights. Um, in Da'an, in Taipei City Constituency 6, Miao Boya uh, didn't manage to uh, secure, a, uh, secure a seat and actually her staunch abolitionist stance was uh, a reason for attacks that she faced um, from the Guomindang. So here I um, remain skeptical about the potential progress on these important human rights issues um, that play a role in Taiwan-Europe relations. Of course, um, there's no need to be dramatic or alarmist. Taiwan is still a shining city upon a hill, but uh, it is important that those issues are addressed. Just like it's important that in the context of the overall positive economic interaction between Taiwan and Europe, the Lai administration addresses these uh, issues such as um, local content requirements for offshore wind and, and uh, export uh, import barriers. So even though the Lai administration will have a lot of space to um, shape the direction of policy reforms, also pertaining to these human rights issues. We are unlikely to see an additional push for these reforms um, from within the uh, legislative union. Um, the new power party, which was also quite strong on the human rights agenda, lost their three electoral seats. They didn't manage to meet the 5% um, uh, threshold in, on, the, on the party list elections. Um, Claire Wang didn't uh, manage to win her uh, seat as a district representative in Xinzhou. So um, it, it, it remains to be seen whether these more mainstream politicians that uh, were successful electorally uh, will be able to um, provide this momentum. So I will conclude here and yield the floor to Heng Yu. Thank you. Oh, good evening, everyone. I'm Heng Yu from the Store Media and uh, covering um, diplomacy and foreign affairs. Um, I'd like to share that the traditional Taiwan's foreign policy really focuses on the United States' relations with Taiwan. But um, in Thai administration, they try to put efforts on enhancing relations between Europe and Taiwan. So we can see an obvious example is this. Lithuania, and then we also opened the new offices in Italy and France. So, and also we invited the speakers of parliamentary um, in some European countries. Um, and uh, so the parliament diplomacy is quite important for the Lai administration, and I'd like to mention that. Um, so now I think obviously by votes, the KMT already announced that the Daniel Han, Han Guoyu perhaps will be the speaker. And uh, well, but his deputy, Zhang Li Jiang, uh, when he was the chairman of KMT, he invited the current EU representative to Taiwan uh, to 
give a speech at the KMT headquarters in 2021. That was the first time EU representative to Taiwan um, gave a speech at KMT headquarters. So which means that uh, Johnny Zhang has, um, he understands the relations um, with European countries and I mean, perhaps the policy, he has the European policies. So maybe it's not, uh, it doesn't need to worry so much about the parliamentary, parliament diplomats will be changed a lot. And uh, also the TPP is a critical minor in the Congress and the, it's a one man party and the chairman, also the former Taipei city mayor, Ke Wenzhe, uh, he was the first uh, Taiwan lo local elected uh, mayor, gave a speech at the European parliament. So, but actually I think he is with the, he, his current the TPP secretary general, Zhou Taizhu, he was the former, uh, he was Rep uh, Taiwanese representative to the Netherlands. So he, I mean, I, I mean, lo those people, they, they do have their policies towards Europe, so they, they don't really, um, so each of them, they understand how to work and uh, enhance the relationship with uh, Europe. And uh, so, but I think, and also the, Thai administration, they try to you uh, not assign the per they try to enhance the relations with European countries and the e European Union by assigning some people who have have experience with the European uh, United States. They, they try to balance the policies and uh, try, try to balance the relations uh, with United States and the. Europe, European Union. Uh, so we can see that the current deputy representative to the United States was the Director General of the European Affairs of the uh, Department of MOFA. And uh, so, I mean, they, in, in journalism, we always uh, focus on the United States, but things, uh, time administration assume the office, we also focus on the relations between Taiwan and the Europe. And, but the, there is one question, is that the uh, EU members, uh, representatives and offices in Taiwan, some of them lost their contact to, with local media. I mean, uh, before some of them, they do background meetings with local media, it's a good way to uh, show what they care and uh, local Taiwanese people can understand what they want and uh, hear their views. But when they lost the contacts with local media, um, it's really hard to tell Taiwanese people um, what Europe, what you, EU countries or what European they, they want. And uh, for example, now we, uh, the TSMC, they will establish a factory in Germany Perhaps for some local people, they think they just want to take advantage of Taiwan, but didn't give um, some support for us. So my suggestion is that the EU members' uh, office and the representatives they have to uh, they have to have contact with the local media to build up the network and. Uh, also now the and uh, so for example for some uh, diplomatic allies when they switch the relations to to China or when China mentions the UN uh, 2758 resolution we always journalists always ask the response from the United States and uh, in my view I think perhaps the EU or EU member countries they can also give some responses to toward this situation, and uh, maybe it makes that Chinese people can feel that the EU really support Taiwan, and uh, 
we, we are uh, working to enhance the uh, relations with like-minded coalitions. So, yeah, I think perhaps my thoughts, I, I finish uh, sharing. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank the three of our experts uh, for your valuable insights and uh, fresh perspectives on politics, international relations, and um, identity of um, Taiwanese citizens. And I would like to uh, propose that we go to questions and Q&A sessions just straight away because we are a little bit behind with the time. Of course, please free to enjoy our refreshments uh, whenever you want. Um, so I would like to start maybe with the first question uh, to uh, Dr. Yo. Um, personally, I think that um, uh, the survey of the election study center um, related to changes in the Taiwanese and Chinese identity is very um, very useful, it's very clear. It shows the trends uh, in the society, uh, so it's very easy to understand uh, to ev anyone who actually would like to show how the trends look like. And uh, my question is, uh, have you ever considered, um, uh, or maybe why not, uh, to add uh, such aspects as um, ethnicity or maybe um, Huaren? A concept to it, or maybe um, do you uh, consider um, Taiwanese indigenous peoples in the research uh, in, a, in any way? So that's my question. Okay, thank you. Um, th this question is more related to study rather than practical one, uh, because uh, when we conduct a survey in uh, three decades ago, we are challenged about uh, what do you mean by Taiwan? And yeah, people mentioned and responded, they mentioned that I'm Huaren, they call it that, and also I'm Han, Han people, and also <laughs> I'm Asian, Yazhou Ren. Okay, all kinds of answers will pop up on this one. And we just keep record on this one. And gradually we find that people, when they ask this similar question, 10 years, 20 years later, people just say I'm Taiwanese. Okay, two issues here. The first is that 20 years ago, the, first, the question was first uh, submitted to the respondent. Respondent was not that familiar with what do we mean by that. They followed this issue. They followed this question mainly based on their perception about who am I, or who am I, whatever. And then 20 years later, well, even today, people are more likely to say, I'm the people on this island. So even though uh, people from mainland China in 49, together with the Chiang Kai-shek government, they would say I'm Taiwanese. And also people uh, come from other countries and become the uh, well, external spouse in Taiwan, they also claim this as Taiwanese. So I, I would say that, yes, we do have some confusion in early period about uh, what do you mean by ethnicity uh, speaking of Taiwanese. But I would say that today when we say we are Taiwanese, it's more constructive one, rather than primordial one or locality one is that when you arrive on this island, you are born here, you live here. So if you identify on this island, you become a Taiwanese, that's okay. And people in Taiwan, we accept this interpretation, this one. Yeah, yes, if we, we, we continue to receive some question about, uh, say, particular from mainland China, say that, well, what do you mean by Taiwanese? It's just an island, it's just a geography term. It's not, a, not even a nation, according to their perspective. But we say, we would reply that it's all everything. That means we don't care what does that mean by that people, or he or she said about his Taiwanese, she's Taiwanese. We just put a very constructive one, Taiwanese, on this one. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, and now we will open the floor to questions and answers. Please uh, introduce yourselves and your affiliation. Okay. Um, my name is Fang Long, uh, Shi Fang Long, Fang Long Xu. I'm from London. 
uh, London School of Economic and Political Science. Okay. Um, my question is, um, Taiwan and the EU, the relationships is difficult. Um, I wonder, I mean, is the issue of Taidu, Taiwan independence, is uh, one of the very major the obstacle for the EU. Okay. And then my next next question is, question is um, who you think, I mean, make the Taidu, Taiwan independence grow bigger and bigger? Is DPP or CCP? Okay, thank you. Yes, maybe we can collect several questions. Um, okay, I'm Isabella from, um, I'm interning right now at the European S Union Center, and I'm also interning for a legislator in Taiwan, Wu Xiyao. Um, so I have a couple of questions actually to the um, first few graphs on the paper, and one of them, the one about the unification and independence stances, um, it shows that in the year 2018, there is a big kind of difference. Um, so the maintained status quo and move towards unification dropped significantly. And I actually wanted to ask why that is and why the maintained status quo and move towards independence kind of like increased a lot. Because that was quite, um, I mean, quite interesting for me to see. If there's any events that happened in 2018 to kind of um, cause this disparity. And also, um, I hope that this is okay if I ask multiple questions, about like the election. So one thing I really kind of saw while I was working here during the election is that the political participation in Taiwan is quite high. I think it's above like 70%. And um, I wanted to ask why is it so high? And since the European Parliament elections are coming up, how can the, I mean, European Parliament elections learn from that and also like increase political participation? Because it's quite low for like the European Parliament like elections. It's, I think about 30%-ish. So yeah, I wanted to ask uh, if there's any lessons we could learn from Taiwan and kind of move it over to Europe. Thank you. Maybe let's do one more before we I don't, yes. Hi, my name is Joje, I'm a Swedish journalist, and I have uh, two questions. So, first of all, before the election, we saw all the presidential candidates. They were visiting the US and Japan. I think Lai didn't go to Japan, but he received some guests from Japan and Taiwan. But no one went to Europe, and also no vice presidential candidate went to Europe. Why is that, do you think? is? Yeah, but no one who participated in the election. No, but I mean visiting before the election to shore up support. Yeah. So, yeah, the candidates were visiting the US and Japan, but not Europe. None of the candidates or the vice president of candidates. Is that because Europe is not important enough for the candidates, or is it because they're not allowed to visit Europe because there's some pushback in the governments or in Brussels? And the second question, uh, let me see. Yeah, the European Parliament has election this summer. So how do you think, maybe Marcin mostly can answer this, how do you think that can affect the relation with Taiwan? What is the worst case scenario? What is the best case scenario for this election? We have Alternative for Deutschland being kind of pro-Chinese, having good, uh, yeah, good opinion figures. So what do you think about the election in, in Brussels? Thank you. Uh, thank you, and I would just like to remind you that you need to use the microphones uh, so the audience online can hear us. Okay. Uh, about the independent issues, who makes it big, bigger? I think the uh, CCP, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, in Taiwan, the independent issue was an open debate issue because uh, just a preference for policy to some degree. So it was debated in the election, uh, particularly after democratization. It was it really an open issue. People just choose, and they choose based on their, their calculation. So, but whenever there was a uh, well, very hostile move 
by Beijing government to Taiwan internationally, that would help Taiwan to grow its own autonomous consensus in Taiwan, on this island. Okay, that also uh, uh, answer to the uh, this the, this issue about uh, why in 18 the uh, TI the Thai independence goes up. That was because of the Hong Kong issues. Hong Kong issue was very bad at that time, and Taiwan is engaged in local election and followed up by president election. And this issue was very highly politicized in Taiwan. It's a public, go public. And the incumbent DPP, they tried to use the Hong Kong event to create an image about a hostile Beijing government, and which is, well, it's the, the bankruptcy of the, the so-called one country, two system. So also attack the competing KMT uh, candidate who visit Hong Kong at that time. So that was the whole issue on this one. But after that, the kind of uh, momentum has a little bit declined this one, back to normal, okay? Uh, and the other one is participation is high in Taiwan. Yes, uh, we are now a compulsory voting system country. We are voluntary. And another issue, actually, I should say that uh, official number about the eligible, eligible electorate is 19 million. But actually, we have around 2 million of population was not in Taiwan. Constantly was not in Taiwan. That means if you put 71 percentage turnout rate, it should put, well, it was based on, say, the whole electorate is 17 million, not 19 million. That's much higher, much more higher. Okay, then why so high? It's not the highest one. The highest one is 82 in it's 2.3 in 2004. That was dramatic. And we do have some survey about why people participate so, so eagerly, also uh, civilian style on this one. We ask people, but we found that people in Taiwan, uh, maybe due to some political socialization or some education, say that, well, voting is a city duty, city duty for ourselves. So even though we are not composed, we are not, we are not mobilized to vote, but we take care about it on this one. And the other additional issue is that, well, we have a very high turnout rate, but we have a very low, I don't say low, it's, a, it's at the middle point about partisan affiliation of the people. That means, uh, I, didn't, I didn't put a picture here, but uh, people who are affiliated with specific political party, their total percentage was not high, has been not, not very high. It's around, maybe just slightly over 50%, say, of the people say that I am affiliated to a certain political party. More than 40 always say, I am independence, I am partisan neutrals. But this independence or partisan neutrals, they did catch the body on elections. So that's the reason, say that, well, even though we have a very high turnout rate, but we are not that politicized in the society on this one. Thank you. Thank you for your um, very interesting question, Professor Shi, about whether um, Taidu uh, constitutes a major obstacle uh, in uh, further developing Taiwan uh, EU ties. I think that it is um, important to, to state that uh, the EU has its own interpretation of uh, one China policy. Uh, there is, uh, I think that it is, uh, in comparison to the formulations of one China policy of some individual member states, at the working definition at the EU level leaves quite a lot of flexibility for um, pragmatic engagements uh, as long as they are short of um, a formal uh, recognition of um, Taiwanese independence. Um, uh, however, the language that is uh, coming out of Brussels and specifically out of EEAS under the leadership of uh, Joseph Borrell is um, quite unequivocal. So. Um, even in the statement that the European External Action Service issued uh, on the day of the elections, um, for the first time, uh, Brussels mentioned in that statement explicitly that uh, it reminds uh, relevant stakeholders that it opposes any unilateral change to uh, status quo. So that's a message that EEAS is projecting at the People's Republic of China, but it's also projecting this message at uh, the DPP. And um, 
in October, um, uh, Joseph Borrell also uh, made uh, very unequivocal comments about his stance on uh, potential Taiwanese independence. He said that uh, Taiwan should not embark on any unilateral declaration of independence. The Taiwanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs responded to the statement by Borrell claiming that uh, Taiwan is already uh, a sovereign and de facto independent state and therefore um, did not need to uh, declare um, de jure uh, independence. So that's very much in line with um, what President Tsai and her administration have been, have been saying over um, uh, the past eight years. So yes, I mean any form of declaration of Taiwanese independence is a, a big no for, um, for Brussels. And I think that it's also interesting to compare the language that is coming out of Brussels with the language that is coming out of Washington because the, the um, uh, Brussels openly states that it opposes any unilateral change to the status quo which implies independence, but then the statements that we saw come out of Washington recently s state that the US does not support uh, Taiwanese independence. And uh, for Taiwan, symbolism is substance and we have to pay attention to every individual word in, in those uh, statements. But when I said that relations between Taiwan and Europe are difficult, uh, I meant that the European Union is difficult uh, in and of itself because it is this block of um, 27 member states with different interests that need to find consensus. And I think that this is a source of strength for Euro Europeans that we are able to sit at one table and um, reconcile uh, our interests and, and come up with um, a common policy, but sometimes because we need to achieve consensus, that policy is um, uh, quite weak. And I think that this is what's happening in terms of uh, EU's approach to uh, China and, and Taiwan. So uh, there are certain uh, individual member states that uh, block a lot of progress on uh, developing a, a more assertive stance vis-a-vis -vis Beijing and a more proactive stance vis-a-vis um, -vis Taipei. Um, Hungary is frequently quoted as a scapegoat, but it's not just Hungary. Uh, I think that we can um, look at countries uh, such as Greece, uh, which has a very strong economic dependence on China. We can look at countries such as Cyprus, um, which have their own issues with um, uh, defining territorial borders and, and defining identity. And uh, Northern Cyprus uh, has been under what the Republic of Cyprus claims is uh, illegal occupation since 1974 and um, some conversations about dealing with the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus um, unrecognized by the EU uh, are even explicitly referred to as the Taiwan solution which for uh, so so never uh, officially um, uh, never officially recognizing the independence of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus but still engaging with it uh, through through uh, economic channels for example so so yeah like Nicosia because of its problems at home uh, does not view uh, Taiwan favorably um, then there is also um, Spain which uh, basically internalized uh, domesticated the Chinese one China principle as its own one China policy and a part of it is um, a part of it is driven by uh, independent uh, movements in Spain, in Catalonia, and in the uh, Basque Country. And actually, nationalist politicians from the Basque Country are some of the most outspoken friends of Taiwan uh, in Spain. Um, so the feature of the European Common Foreign and Security Policy is that uh, we reach decisions by consensus, and that's why. It takes time to achieve progress. That's why it's often difficult to agree on issues, and we do it. We, we do find this common ground. But progress is slow, and progress is, uh, is difficult because of um, these factors. And um, there was, uh, I, I, I just want to make a quick comment on, on uh, Isabel's question about uh, high political participation. I think that's something to be. Um, said about uh, Taiwan and um, how it uh, transitioned to democracy systemically is that um, education uh, plays a very uh, important role here and in um, global assessments of effectiveness of civic education, um, Taiwan uh, usually um, outperforms its uh, not only regional peers but also uh, many Western countries. And, um, you know, in uh, political science, we actually 
uh, recognize that political uh, participation has many forms and we shouldn't measure it only through participation in elections because participation in elections is one of the most costly activities because, uh, well, in, in Taiwan you don't have to go out of your way to register to vote necessarily, but you know, you have to get yourself to the polling station, it takes time. Uh, there is no absentee voting in Taiwan, so for young people there is a literal economic cost. I mean, think about it, if you're a young college graduate that makes 30,000 NT in an um, entry-level job, then going back to Pingdong or Jinmen for a day to cast your vote can cost you 15% of your monthly salary. So in Taiwan, political participation in the form of uh, voting is literally very costly. And uh, I think that it's this uh, strong system of civic education that makes people uh, um, feel so strongly committed to, to maintaining uh, political, um, uh, political participation at, at, at high levels. And then um, to Yoye's question about European Parliament elections, um, one of the t trends uh, that we see ahead of the European Parliament elections is that uh, right-wing parties are on the rise. So parties that are in the European Parliament affiliated with the uh, European Conservatives and Reformists group, ECR, and um, with the uh, Identity and Democracy group, ID. So right and far right. And uh, I think that you definitely have a point about uh, AfD in Germany um, uh, being a pro-Chinese uh, wildcard. But then, in general, um, whether we like it or not, right-wing parties um, are often more Taiwan-friendly than uh, left-wing parties. So in the European left, and not only European left, we see the same thing among uh, progressives in the United States as well. I think that uh, a lot of uh, politicians on the left have um, forgotten about Taiwan. And I also think that in um, that uh, we still haven't really um, updated our discourse about uh, China and Taiwan because uh, a lot of it is still rooted in anti-communist rhetoric, and we see it very clearly in um, um, Central Eastern Europe. So I can speak about the uh, concrete example of Poland. Um, in the previous uh, same, so the lower chamber of parliament, I did an analysis of um, uh, meeting minutes of uh, the same plenary. And the most outspoken member of same who's, who advocated for Taiwan was uh, Dobromir Sośnierz, who comes from the far-right uh, Confederacja. And uh, Confederacja is uh, very explicitly Eurosceptic um, in support of a potential poll exit. Um, but the narrative on Taiwan, and on Hong Kong, um, in Central Eastern Europe was very much captured by the far right because they keep viewing um, Taiwan and, uh, and, and Hong Kong as the good guys in the Chinese-speaking Chinese world um, who are standing up to the evil communists. So. Um, that's why I think that um, the rise of the right in Europe is interesting uh, from the Taiwanese standpoint because it might maybe somewhat counterintuitively bring some more supportive voices to the European Parliament. So I, I think United States and EU say that they don't speak, uh, they don't support Taiwan's independence, just what China wants to hear and not really say that to Taiwan, just because the uh, time administration and the, the VP Lai reiterates that the, they will maintain, uh, the country official name is the Republic of China and the Taiwan. So I mean, it's maintains the status quo, which means that they think we are already independent. So there is no question about officially announced independence. Um, and also regarding to the candidates uh, visiting Taiwan during the elect election campaign, I think because just because we don't have that tradition, usually uh, candidates that visit the United States and Japan, they prefer to visit current uh, government officials. But I think it's quite sensitive to meet with uh, EU 
Euro European Union officials, or they cannot visit all member states, so they just skip the Europe trip. And uh, also, uh, in my view, for the high participation in voting, just perhaps it's a system difference, because in Taiwan, usually there are two major parties com competitive. Competition, so uh, people can easily decide. But in Europe, there are so many parties, and uh, now, uh, but this time there is a third party, TPP. I mean, uh, in my opinion, I think just because young generation they grew up under uh, DPP's governance, so they think it's long enough, and uh, they don't have positive impression of KMT, so they prefer to. Uh, to vote a new one, uh, perhaps that TPP will give, uh, bring some changes for them. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can uh, collect maybe two more questions. I would like to also uh, encourage our online audience to write the questions in uh, our chat box. Any questions if you want to know more about uh, Taiwan-EU relations? Oh, really? Okay. Okay. Okay, let me just uh, find the questions. Um, okay, so maybe I, I will read the questions that we uh, received online. Uh, could you elaborate on the foreign policy of the third party? Uh, Taiwan People's Party, what's their role in enhancing or not uh, relations with Europe, for example? And that's the question from, uh, from our colleague from the European Value Center, Zuzanna Koskova. There's, uh, there's one more question, maybe I will read it also. Um, would you, who would you consider to be a strong Thai and ally of Taiwan in Europe, and how do you expect this to develop in upcoming years? And that's the question from uh, Jakub Yanda, director of European Value Center for a Security Policy. And that's the last question. As I mentioned, that look. Um, he was the first uh, locally elected um, mayor, gave a speech at European Parliament in 2018. So, I mean, for, uh, in my view, I think he knows, he, he thinks he has relations or he ha already has some uh, policies towards the Europe. Europe. And also, he, I think he relies on, uh, hugely on, the former representative to Netherlands, Zhou Taizhu, because um, uh, during the mayor government, um, during his mayor tenure, he also relies on the Zhou Taizhu's policy. So, I mean, uh, yes, towards Europe, he, I mean, he he only has really little relations with each one with the United States, Japan, and uh, Europe, but all, always also uh, rely on one person. So that's why his foreign policy is quite uh, um, ambiguous, not really clear as other ma two major parties, they always say um, not. I mean, for TP DPP, it's obvious they really close pro the United States, and uh, for KMT, they say pro US, and uh, be friendly with China. Uh, and the TPP, they like, says that he wants to be the middle way, which means he wants to be um, make friends with all sides. So we, but I think so far now, um, they, they don't really focus on the foreign policy. So because the, we, we will have uh, local elections uh, in 2026, and uh, 
the news already says that the TPP is ready for the local elections. So, so far, the next two years, they will focus the domestic issues first. And uh, so for them, I think for the foreign policies, they will maintain the same as current government. So uh, perhaps I can address the second question about the strongest ally of Taiwan in Europe. I think that um, this is a, a really uh, layered question because uh, we could uh, analyze this question through the lens of Brussels, so once again through EU27. So where do we find allies in the um, European institutions? Uh, we can look at it uh, through the lens of member states, so which member states are more um, forthcoming in, in, in building their position vis-a-vis -vis, um, Taiwan. Uh, we can also um, use individual political actors as our unit of analysis here. So maybe I'll start with this last point. I think that um, there is a lot of potential in developing more uh, party diplomacy, political party to political party cooperation um, between uh, political parties in Taiwan, and not only the two major ones, uh, but also um, smaller parties. I mean. Um, let's remember that even though the Taiwanese political system is dominated by um, the DPP and the KMT, um, as of December last year, there were 92 officially registered political parties in Taiwan, and in 2024 uh, legislative elections, 16 of them uh, competed. So um, th that's why I'm emphasizing that there's a lot of space for uh, collaboration here. And with uh, the Tsai administration, we have seen that um, some uh, ties uh, between Taiwanese and European political actors were able to develop based on the perceived uh, siblinghood between the Liberal Democratic Progressive Party, a member of the Council of Asian Liberals and Democrats regionally, and the Liberal International uh, globally. Um, so uh, one of the examples is um, the uh, Free Democratic Party in Germany. So um, as a part of the uh, traffic light coalition, uh, FDP has clearly positioned itself as one of the uh, most outspoken voices on uh, Taiwan uh, within Berlin. And um, it was FDP that sent their uh, minister of education, uh, Bettina Watzinger, as, uh, in, 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 a, in a historic delegation at ministerial level uh, to, uh, to Taiwan. In Lithuania, uh, we see a similar development. Uh, the Liberal Freedom Party is, uh, the Liberal Freedom Movement is one of the uh, members of the center, center-right coalition in Vilnius and uh, Auschwitz Armonaita, a minister of economy and innovation is also um, a very uh, good friend of, uh, of Taiwan and I, I, I believe that um, the, her party affiliation plays a role here. Um, in Europe, but outside of the European Union, we see uh, similar tendencies. So um, last year, uh, we saw uh, the first uh, Norwegian parliament delegation to Taiwan in 17 years. And it was led by the chairwoman of Venstre, which is the Norwegian Liberal Party. And uh, she was very outspoken about uh, DPP and uh, Tsai Ing-wen being a part of the liberal family that Venstre is also, uh, also a part of. Um, at, the, uh, at the level of, of member states, um, I think that the Czech model uh, really uh, warrants uh, uh, our attention. Um, and uh, I, I know that maybe my affiliation doesn't make me the most uh, uh, objective person to talk about it, but um, I, I think that the uh, Czech model is really interesting is, uh, is because um, Czechia is not uh, really rocking the boat. So uh, Minister uh, Lipavsky is very clear on the fact that Czechia man maintains its one China policy. And um, that, is, that is there to stay. There is no appetite in Europe or in the Czech Republic concretely to, to get rid of the one China policy. And, and, and that's fine. But uh, Czechia is a model for other European countries in, in the sense that it showcases the flexibility that uh, we have in uh, engaging with Taiwan while respecting um, one China policy. So um, we, uh, Dr. Yo talked a little bit about uh, security cooperation between um, Taiwan and Europe. I think it is very noteworthy that 
um, the uh, Czech Defense University in Berno and the National Defense University in Taiwan have um, formal cooperation. So it is still cooperation between uh, academic institutions, but it definitely um, extends the possibility of exchange in the um, uh, defense and, and security realm. And I think that it's also really important that uh, Czech institutions are very consistent about their uh, willingness in engaging Taiwan within the bounds of the uh, One China policy, because we, we in Prague, um, the uh, president is, is um, uh, very friendly towards Taiwan. He was um, the first uh, European head of state to issue a congratulatory message following the uh, most recent presidential, election, uh, presidential and legislative elections uh, in Taiwan. Um, both uh, leaders of both chambers of uh, the parliament have led delegations um, to uh, Taiwan. So, so this, is, um, this is all um, really noteworthy. I think that a big problem in Europe, whether we talk about the EU or individual member states, is a lack of Taiwan literacy. So people don't get Taiwan. And it's a part of a bigger problem that Europe doesn't get China. Um, and uh, unfortunately, these two are interconnected. So there are some good initiatives uh, in Europe to bolster um, the understanding of key stakeholders of China. So. Um, for example, the European Commission started hosting seconded think tankers uh, um, uh, as uh, their in-house uh, China experts. Um, Germany, of course, has its um, widely discussed uh, China strategy that uh, aims at supporting interdepartmental cooperation um, on China. And um, as a, the, the publication of the German China strategy also gave a very big boost to Merix, the Mercator Institute of China Studies, which is uh, one of the prime European institutions trying to get China right. Uh, that's all very important, but still a lot of Taiwan work is not done by experts in Taiwan studies that has established itself as a separate uh, field of uh, intellectual inquiry. It's done by uh, China scholars. And, um, with all due respect to colleagues who are Sinologists and China experts, being a China expert doesn't make you a Taiwan expert. And we have this knowledge gap. And um, what, that, what it means concretely in politics. For example, I believe that in Poland, one of the largest uh, problems that uh, we have in our China strategy is that there is none. And uh, there are huge disagreements even within individual parties on, on how to deal with China. So. Um, let's take a look at law and justice, which uh, is now in opposition, but uh, held power for, for eight years. Some uh, high-ranking figures in law and justice, um, for example, member of the European Parliament, Anna Fotyga, are some of the most outspoken pro-Taiwan figures in European politics. And um, a lot of them, a lot of them, uh, sorry, <laughs> a lot of them um, use this um, anti-communism frame to, to embrace Taiwan, but, but, but they do it. But then some uh, high-ranking members of the party, for example, high-ranking Senate members, um, were leaders of uh, the Poland-China parliamentary group and were frequent guests of the uh, Chinese ambassador in Warsaw and publicly um, embraced the most recent five-year plan as a developmental model for Warsaw. And it's all within the same party. And I do think that it's uh, a problem of education. So um, there's a big gap that, that we need to fill uh, to help Europe get Taiwan right. Okay, um. Regarding to the uh, foreign policy of the third party, uh, to make it short, none. Okay, I never heard yet. Okay. Uh, just as I didn't see clearly about the party's manifesto in this campaign, neither clearly. So it's difficult to define or to find the position he will take about the uh, external relations, particular to Europe. Okay, and to a larger extent, I would say that uh, not only for the new party but also the two other political parties, the KMT, DPP, even though they have some uh, European policies, quote unquote. Uh, I always say that that kind of the emphasis was not as strong as their U.S.-Taiwan relations. And the main reason for this one is the security issues, because to some degree the U.S. has been the uh, security guarantor to uh, Taiwan. That matters a lot, but not the case for the European or European countries. So that makes European-Taiwan relations mainly focus on economic side. 
not extend to say security or some geopolitical issues until recently. So that could be another opportunity for, the, for Taiwan that, well, not only the government, but also for the major political parties. The three major parties, they got to think about what to do with European in terms of their China strategy. And that, that, that will be the next text for Taiwan. Okay? And also for the agent of the European-Taiwan relations, I would say that well, uh, we do find that uh, diplomat, uh, parliamentary diplomacy is useful. And it's a cross-partisan consensus in Taiwan. That means regardless you are opposition or incumbent, they all support expanding Taiwan's relations with European countries. And they concur on this one. Even though, uh, well, in terms of numbers, that the uh, uh, incumbent party is more leading on this one, more active on this one, but the opposition, they are not opposed to this one. So they concur that uh, it should be a national effort to do well expanding relations with other countries other than US only. That, that's what we try to do. And uh, this was more obvious in recent years, particularly after the, uh, the, the COVID-19 issues in these two years on this one. I think our meeting is coming to an end. Uh, thank you for coming uh, to the event and thank you our uh, three speakers. Thank you Dr. Yo, uh, Mr. Jerzewski and Mr. Dien for uh, sharing with us your insights on the current politics in Taiwan. Thank you very much. And of course, thank you uh, uh, I would like to thank our online audience for joining us as well. And just a uh, very last round of thanks. I would uh, like to express my gratitude to uh, Mrs. Scott Giletic for being a fantastic moderator tonight. Uh, also, pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Also to Elaine Ke, who supported us behind the scenes. And to our colleagues working on the technical arrangements for tonight, making sure that tonight's cross-continental event is a success. Thank you. And of course, we still have time for the networking. And uh, if you would like to enjoy water, green tea, <laughs> and uh, some fruits, Everything very healthy, as you can see. Please enjoy. Thank you.